Karl Marx, born 1818, lived till 1883, whatever it says in your program, it's always right, Uh, 1883. What's important to note, like Nietzsche, uh, in fact, like with all the philosophers we dealt with, particularly Nietzsche and Marx, they were born into the Europe that followed Napoleon. And I I mentioned before that what Napoleon did is basically blow Europe up. The forces were at work changing the political and social structure of Europe. Napoleon sort of accelerated those and, and, and sort of just blew up the old system. He didn't make anything new. Uh, the people who made something new were, were three important, I mean, a lot more than three people, of course, but uh, three p- people in particular, which were uh, uh, Talleyrand, Metternich, and Castle Rock were all foreign ministers of one sort or another, and they negotiated a true, a, a, a European-wide treaty that held, depending on how you want to score, for between 75 and 105 years of peace in, in, in main sections of Europe, which was really historically an astonishing achievement. It's one of the great achievements in, in, in foreign policy because they negotiated a treaty that held, as far as large-scale warfare goes, uh, uh, nearly 100 years of peace after a couple of hundred years where they hadn't had 10 years of peace. Um, so, but what the one way they did this is they created a whole series of interlocking weak governments. And so while there was continent-wide relative peace, in any given region there was political instability. And you had all of these forces um, that were working one against the other um, to, to try and become more conservative, more liberal, to, to bring back the monarchy. No, 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 let's bring back a radical Republican government. No, 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 let's do some sort of, uh, of communal system, early socialist movements. And so you have this strange combination of peace in a, in a military sense and, and a, a fair degree of stability on a large scale, but if you were in what became Germany, if you were in what is France today, if you were in Italy, even if you were in England, it was a time of very great political instability, a really surprising amount of political ferment. And this is what Marx grows up in. He grows up in a period of of, of remarkable social mobility, intellectual change in flux, and and political questioning. Uh, Part of what's driving this is what he ends up being a specialist in, of course, is economics. A huge change is afoot. We're going to talk about that, but just a little bit on his background. Um, the most important thing to understand about Marx is he was educated in jurisprudence and law, basically, but was never really all that interested in law. He was interested pretty much from very early on in what was going on. He kept saying the purpose of philosophy is not to explain the world, but to change the world. That's what he wanted to do. We have to have some ideas, some concepts that will change the world. And the first thing he got involved in, both in um, Germany, well, modern-day Germany, and in Paris, he, by the way, I'm not going to try to track this out for you, but Marx got thrown out of Paris for, on four separate occasions, thrown out of France. Um, so he'd get thrown out, they would change government, they'd invite him back, he'd get thrown out, they'd change government, they'd invite him back, he'd get thrown out. He, he did that four times, and then he would go, uh, Germany, France, Bonn, Belgium, France, Paris, Belgium, England, Paris, Germany. So it really is complicated. But he was doing the same stuff all the time, wherever he was. He was either on a newspaper, editing a newspaper, or writing some version of a newspaper. And he is uh, generally remarked as the first person to do on-the-spot reporting. Which is to say, if there was some big uprising happening, he would go there and say, I went to the corner of this and that, and there were 500 people in the street throwing rocks at the police, and the police weren't doing anything, and these people were doing this, and they were doing that, and it was mostly the poor that were out, and the middle class stayed in their shops, and this represents this kind of problem. This notion that if you want to report about something, you should just go there, look at it, and write it down. Um, with, With a particular political tinge, always a particular political tinge. He was what we would call today a social progressive. Um, he, he really thought that people deserved a fair shake. And at times, this would be very popular with the local governments. Hence, Paris would invite him back. So he'd be in Paris for a while. And they'd change governments and they'd go, no, 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 censor everything and kick him out of the country. Right? And this happened over and over for him. But from his earliest days, he was focused very sharply on the con- actual conditions of people. Not in an abstract sense. 
And this is his big beef with Hegel. He, he came under the sort of sway of a, of a disciple of Hegel known as Fauerbach. And his thesis on Fauerbach is important because it's when he says Hegel is all wrong. And what he says is wrong with Hegel is that Hegel is, Hegel is an idealist. And what he does is he focuses on the abstract. If you're an idealist, you say somewhere out there is a perfect world, a perfect idea, a perfect law, a moral code, and then we compare ourselves to that. That's, that's the definition, sort of a sketchy definition of an idealist. And what Hegel had argued is that there are these forces in history, these concepts, these ideas, that evolve through a dialectical process where you have a thesis, whatever the, the Western concept of man. Then you get an antithesis of that, a response to that, which is to say an ideal uh, noble person, chivalry. And then the synthesis of those two ideas produce the next thing, which is itself then becomes a thesis. And so it goes... Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, which is a new thesis. And that history progresses by all of these ideal categories coming into conflict with each other and producing new ideas. And this is teleological, which means it's directional. It's going someplace. And the place it's going is the end of history and the perfect man. Pretty soon, 100 years, 150 years, we will live in a perfect world. Because... Every time we do a thesis, antithesis, synthesis, we end up in a better thesis. And then that one goes, and we get a better one, and a better one, and pretty soon we will be in a world that has the perfect government and is inhabited by perfect man, of which Hegel called the end of history, which means there's no more dialectical progress because all the problems have been worked out, and the last man, which means not that there's only one person, but that the people who are left are the perfect realization of human possibility. Marx said this was crap, utter and complete nonsense. <laughs> Marx is like, what the hell are you talking about? There's an idea in the world. There's no ideas in the world. There aren't concepts in the world. He says what's in the world is the world. Man is in the world. You want to know what's going on in the world? Go look at the world. Look at the statistics. Talk to people. See what they say. How are they living? What are they doing? What are the facts on the ground? That's why he's a materialist. He's absolute. That's why Marx is always referred to as a materialist and a founder of what's called dialectical materialism. He keeps Marx's idea of the dialectic. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, new thesis, on you go. But he said, you don't, it's not an ideal category, it's actually lived by people in the world. He also believed in the teleology of, Mar of Hegel. He said, we are going someplace, and the place we're getting to is better. And so there's no use really complaining about what's going on, even if it's bad. What you want to do is understand where it's going and try and get there as fast as you can. Because there's no use fighting the tides of history, because this is what's going to happen. So this is all a, a sort of shorthand of what his thesis on Fauerbach is. Eliminate and resist the notion of idealism by focusing on the here and now, what's really going on in people's lives, and then extrapolating that into the future. So he keeps the structure of Hegel, but tries to get rid of the idealism by replacing it with materialism. So if you've ever heard the phrase dialectical materialism, it means, I dislike half of Hegel. <laughs> and I like the other half of Hegel. That's really, really awesome. That's, that's a, a, a basically what it means. So he's out there, and, and he's doing the newspaper, and he's getting kicked out of places, and he's getting in trouble, and they have sort of the Communist Manifesto, and he's getting socialist ideas. But it's important to note that the socialists never really liked Marx that much, because he's not an idealist. Because he really is, he always wants to talk about the facts, the numbers. Uh, he's, he's a political economist with heavy, heavy philosophical leanings, if you really want to think about it. Um, and eventually, after lots of struggle, he gets booted out and he ends up in London. Um, and, and this is where most of his significant political writings take place, um, either just before that period, but mostly in the period where he's in London. Now, he's a refugee. His English is not so good originally, although it gets very much better later in his life. And he has no money or almost no money. And what Marx does is he lives for the rest of his life, this is about 1846, so he lives about another 40 years, um, supported, he and his family supported about 95% by Ingalls. 
Ingalls gives them all the money that they have for the rest of their lives. Um, to the point where Ingalls diminished the, his quality of living a great deal so that he could support Marx's family. Marx was not good with money. He was good with money in the abstract. <laughs> he was not good with money in the concrete. Uh, and so he's, he's living in the direst of poverty at this point, particularly when they first moved there. So much so that one of his children dies in the home probably because they could not afford medicine. Um, and they, and they love their children very much, and so this was a devastating blow to them. But they lived in very, very severe poverty for years and years and years. But what Marx did is he tried to organize people around his political ideas, and he did lots and lots of research. And what I want to go through tonight is sort of the major steps of his research, and then how he brought that all together into this argument of the, that be, kind of has become known as dialectical materialism, or, or sort of early communism. He really wasn't a communist. We'll talk about why that is. And then sort of, because, you know, where we are today, a little bit of what this has to say about where we are today. Um, so here he is. He's in England. He has no money. None. Zero. So much so that sometimes he couldn't leave the house because he had pawned his only pair of pants. <laughs> right? You know you're poor when. <laughs> right? so this is officially a sign. Uh, if you're wondering. Um, but when he did have pants, he spent hours and hours and hours at the British Museum doing research. And what he was doing research on was economic statistics and social history. Again, how did people really live? How did they live in 1700? How did they live in 1800? How did they live now? How many people were employed? What were they paid? What would the wages add up to? What was the cost of living? He did just a massive amount of research. And what this ended up to is he came up with a couple of, of, of theories. First he came up with, and this is not original to him, but at the philosophical foundations is, is the notion that property is theft. Right? And he gets this in part from Adam Smith. And the idea is, we live in a perfect example of this, right? Because... We come, our, you know, our ancestors arrive in America and they look, whoa, here's a continent and nobody lives here, so the land must be ours for free. <laughs> and some of the people who lived here said, oh, excuse me, and we shot them. Um, and then the land was ours for free, right? And he said that this is necessary. This is how it always is. To convert property, land, into private property, there is a moment when... People who are sharing the land or using the land have to be gotten rid of. And the people who gain access to the land then have to be protected by your governmental system. Now, this, this isn't just capitalism. This is, he says this is necessarily so. Uh, my neighbor used to always say, I'm not so upset that we stole the land from the Indians, but since we didn't pay them for it, why do I have to pay a mortgage? <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm the one getting screwed, and they're getting screwed. Well, who's making the money, right? Somebody is making a good deal here. And what Marx argues, and I think it's pretty convincing, is that this is, he calls this political economy. This is where this phrase comes from. That your economy is always political. It has to be. When the government steps in in whatever way and says, you get the land and you don't, and we're going to protect it under these rules, there's your politics and the structure of your economy as based on property. So he tracks out various ways you can organize property under various systems of, of, of political economy. But he says, remember, it's always theft. Originally, no one owned the land. Now somebody does. And how that transition takes place is always ugly and messy. All right. So when you talk about economy and economic structures, remember you're always talking about some version of politics and political thinking. And when you're talking about politics, you're always talking about <coughs> economics at some level. Second idea he comes up with, I'll give you, these are not in order, but we'll put them all together and make his big thesis, is, is called the labor theory of value. And this is the idea of why is something worth something? Why am I able to charge money? Well, let's see if we have this podium, right? Very nice podium. Somebody at some point paid money for this podium. Where did that value come from? Now, people have tried to say it's use value. Marx said, no, this, this is silly. It's, it's not use value. 
Because you can use things without paying for them, and you have things that are useless that you're willing to pay for. And he gives long explanations for this. And his argument is, look, what you end up paying for is congealed labor. You have raw materials, and then you have the labor that took to put the raw materials in some form that somebody else would buy. And so he said the value of objects is just accumulated labor. And if you get a lot of labor that's cheap, then the price of things will decline, China. And what you'll end up with <laughs> is a general reduction in the price of things, not because the things are worth less, but because the labor that went into them costs less. We, again, we've just experienced a huge example of that over the last 15 years. So things have gotten cheaper. Why? Because all of a sudden we have this vast pool of cheap labor to produce them. So the value of something is, in fact, the accumulation of labor in that object. Um, obviously, this isn't perfectly true, but, but this, was, this was his argument. It's, it's a good general outline. But he said, where does that value come from, then? Well, it comes from the work that someone puts into it. So value is actually someone's labor alienated from them, objectified outside of them. And more importantly, somebody made a profit on this, right? Someone sold this, imported it, made it, and they made a profit. All that money is the alienation of more labor value that somebody put into something than they got back. If the value of something is the labor that's put into it, and I get to keep 10% off the top, I've stolen, according to Mark, 10% of the labor value that went into it. I'm accumulating as a capitalist. What I'm doing is I'm accumulating the work of other people. I'm not doing the work. I'm taking it from them. And then what I do, and this is the beautiful part, is I pay them for their work with money. Marx loved money. Money is great. He says, you, you, I pay you, or the idea of money, I'll pay you for your work. So now you give back your labor alienated from you in the form of cash. It's not your labor anymore. It's been turned to abstract, and you're getting less than you put in. If you didn't get less than you put in, what would happen to me as a business person? Go bankrupt. I'd go bankrupt. So I'm necessarily ripping you off. I have no choice. The system is set up to rip you off. You do more work than you get compensated for. Your work is alienated from you. And then a portion of that is returned to you in an abstract form in cash. This is a bad system. Marx is like, this is not a, what the hell are we doing? This is no good. And he says, what happens when you do this? He said, well, look around. This is back to his newspaper days. Go and see where the laborers work. The proletariat laboring in the cities live in houses without fresh air or sunlight. He says, fresh air and sunlight, the natural gifts of mankind, have become unnecessary. We, we, they're no longer, they're, they've become a luxury item. You don't need them to survive. He says, man is not an animal who survives. But even fresh air and sunshine has become a luxury that you have to pay for. We can charge you for everything. And he says, so this does not improve the quality of man's life. It decreases it. Now, along with these lines, another a aspect of this is he said, look, not only is the capitalist trying to make a profit, and this is, if you want to know what's going on today, you have to understand this. And, and this is what I call this is 10 minutes and you have an MBA. You're now going to all get a master's in business administration. Um, so you, you must understand businesses, and, and Marx, again, as far as I know, is the one who worked this out in detail, but businesses and companies are not trying to make a profit. This is a, a common misunderstanding of capitalism. They are not interested in making a profit. In fact, they are legally, if you are a publicly traded company, you are legally precluded from trying to make a profit. You're not allowed to do that, honestly. I'm not making this up. 
What you have to try to do as a CEO, by law, is make as much profit as you possibly can. Maximize your profit at every moment. And Mark said, this is inevitable. But let me give you an example of this. I'll, I'll give you the numbers. Let's say we have two businesses, and we each invest a million dollars. Business A and business B. We each invest one million dollars at the beginning of the year. At the end of the year, business A has a million dollars plus one hundred thousand dollars. Business B has a million dollars plus two hundred thousand dollars. How much money did business A make? No, they lost one hundred thousand dollars. This is what you must understand. If you go to graduate school, it's the first thing they teach you. As far as I know, it's the only thing they teach you. I'm serious. It's only a little teeny tiny joke. What you did is you lost one hundred thousand dollars. This is called opportunity cost. You had the opportunity to make $200,000, and you didn't. Therefore, you lost $100,000 in opportunity costs. You're a bad business person. You must change your investment strategy. Right now, Boeing is laying off workers. Why? <laughs> opportunity costs. Anybody know how much they made last year? 2.7 billion dollars profit. 2.7 billion, they're laying off workers. Over the last 10 years, Boeing has made over 100 billion dollars in profits. They're laying off workers. Why? Because they should have made more. They are not interested in making 2.7 billion dollars. It seems like a lot. You think, wow, a couple of billion dollars, aren't you happy? No. <laughs> We are not happy. We must lay off workers because we should have made more than that. We should have made three billion or five billion or nine billion. Somebody out there made more, therefore we lost money. Two effects of this. The capitalist is driven to maximize the amount of labor. Notice we have the labor theory of value to maximize the amount of labor squeezed out of any given industry. Because if I pay my workers a little more than my competitor, even if I make a profit, I've lost money. This is right. I hear this confusion all the time. You watch the news or this, they say, well, you know, you know they made money and they, you know, they're fighting this raise in wages or this insurance bill or anything like that. Yes, they always will. Not because they're afraid of losing money. It's because there are, any kind of increase in cost simply means they are not maximizing the kind of money they could have made. So if, if you don't maximize that profit, there's a couple of chairs right here. Uh, if you don't maximize that profit, here's the other thing that happens. If my business returns 10% and your business returns 20%, which business are people going to want to invest in? 20 percent. You see, we know how capitalism works. <laughs> Why invest with this person? Because he runs a crappy business. <laughs> you see, we're all capitalists now. It's beautiful. Uh, we, we know that we want to invest with the guy that's getting 20 percent returns. And you know what? This is exactly what happens. Everybody invests with this guy. This guy cannot get investors. He goes out of business. And then this guy gets all this person's clients and gets bigger. The second thing this means, besides the fact that they're driven to continuously strive to squeeze every possible last ounce of labor value out of the workers, is monopoly. We, we, we must form a monopoly. Because if we compete against each other, let's say we both made $150,000 last year. We go, wow, we've got to increase our profits. Well, if we advertise, that costs money. If we cut our, our sales price, that costs money. If we reduce the quality, we might lose some customers. 
ah, you collude. It does not take business people very long to figure this out. You collude with your competitors. You form combines. You, you form a monopoly. If you have a monopoly, think oil, you can charge what the hell ever you want. Or a lot. Diamonds. It's, it's Valentine's Day. Hopefully you all get lovely diamonds from the people who love you. Diamonds are, by the way, nearly worthless. They're also a monopoly. And it turns out you can take something that is nearly worthless, monopolize it, and make a lot of money off of it. It's great. So if you buy a diamond for $1,000, you've probably only paid $975 more than it's worth. <laughs> but you can't get access to the diamonds because of the De Beers and a few other companies have totally monopolized the world market. That way they make lots of money. You can also go to the Henry's Hardware and get a diamond bit saw. Diamonds are not expensive. If they were, you wouldn't put them on saw blades. <laughs> right? And so they're driven to do things like monopolize the oil market, monopolize the diamond market, monopolize the aerospace industry. How many uh, companies do we have that manufacture commercial airlines in the world? Airplanes? Two. And you know what? They're both hugely profitable. Or if they get a little less than usually profitable, they just lay a bunch of people off. By the way, uh, Boeing and um, Airbus, the, the European consortium that is Airbus, has decided to cooperate. <laughs> because, of course, why compete? It makes so much more sense to work together and share components and engine development and all that. Eventually, we'll have one company. And then that company will really make money. So, you have this system where monopoly and pressures are absolute and the drive to extract every last value of labor out of people is absolute. That's why I get value. I squeeze people. And so Marx combined these two things and he said, all right, here's what's happening. You have the working proletariat. Companies get bigger, they hire more people, but they squeeze them harder. And then those companies combine and get bigger and hire more people, but then squeeze them harder. You can see where this is leading. Eventually you get so much power coordinated in so few people's hands, and they're squeezing so many people so hard, <coughs> those people will rebel. So this is a scientific fact. So you have this growing class of proletariat workers who are being exploited more and more aggressively. And you can track that out. The records on this are very clear. Um, if you go back in England, and particularly great records, if you go back to the time of the Black Death, about half, the, well, say half, 35% of the working population died. And you know what? Wages for workers went right through the roof. Wow, there's no coincidence there. And so there, and then slowly the population built back up. The, they started sheep farming, which means you wanted people off the land because you wanted to put the sheep there. You had enclosure fights, conversion of public property into private holdings. And so wages go down, down, down. Poverty goes up, up, up. Ireland is a great case study in this. Ah, uh, Then you start getting the factories. People start coming into the cities. They start pulling people into the cities. This drives up a little bit labor in the countryside, makes people unhappy. But as English factories grow increasingly labor intensive, they need more people. So you start bringing in kids. Right? Originally you don't want kids. Kids aren't great workers, but it's better to pay kids a little bit when you need workers than it is to pay adult people a lot. And once you put kids into the mix, well now you've expanded your labor pool. <coughs> Well, and then you start bringing women into the picture. Right? So if half the population before really wasn't able to work, well, now you expand it and you, you let them work. So you drive wages down even further. A lot of countries had laws that did not allow women to work in factories. And, and in, in the early 20th century, this became sort of a women's rights issue. Well, in the 19th century, it was an employee union issue because if women could work, it just drove wages down. It was bad for women and men. 
It was a way to protect families, basically. And so Marx is tracking all this out. He says, well, what's going to happen? You keep squeezing them and increasing the population of people who are getting squeezed and exploited. You squeeze them and exploit them and expand them. The wealthy, the capitalist class, grows increasingly small but rich. And he said, well, this is just, this is just going to explode. How long can this go on? So you have the thesis, which is capitalist, private property, and the advent of, of basically the manufacturing economy. The antithesis, which is the rise of the proletariat. You can't have the capitalist manufacturing class without the working class. They, they, you, they're necessarily, they go together. But one is the antithesis of the other. And then the conflict between these two, the synthesis, Marx thought, would be the overthrow of capitalism and the destruction of that system which would give rise to some form of socialism or communism. He was very vague on what this actually ever gave rise to. But he said that this crash is coming, there is no doubt. So does that make sense? So you've got the labor theory of value. It all sounds not terribly unfamiliar, right? I mean, he's not. I think in a lot of ways, he's just really right about a lot of this stuff. His predictions about the future turn out to be a little wonky, but the, the notion of this is exactly how capitalists work. They have to maximize their return. Uh, labor theory of value turns out to be excellent in a lot of ways. It's not perfect, but it's excellent in a lot of ways. He struggled with one little part, though, and this turns out to be the key part. He said... What you also get with the capitalist class is you get a rise of, of what we would call the middle class. He called it the bourgeoisie, but what we call the middle class. This is a class that doesn't necessarily own a lot of capital, but is clearly not the proletariat. And he considered the, the middle class, the bourgeoisie, to be essentially sort of um, a virus or, or a pariah class. It's just sort of a, a virus on the, on the life of the body politic. They just sucked juice out and really didn't do anything. At least capitalists were doing something. They were investing in factories and building things and, and making machines and exporting and importing, and that you could understand. And the workers were working, but what the hell were all these other people doing? And insurance offices and stockbrokers. Even then, nobody could figure out what they did. <laughs> right? And, and, and Marx had several names for these people, and it goes all the way from the hot bourgeoisie which were people who were clearly wealthy, but didn't own anything and didn't produce anything. He didn't, it really, this sort of blew his mind. Then you had the regular bourgeoisie, which was sort of all the clerks and the assistant managers and the advisors that go along with business. All the way down to what he called the lumpen proletariat, which is a great name, the lumpen proletariat. And these are all the people like the pipe fitters. They had technical skills. They, they somehow worked in the system, but they never really seemed to work in the factory. Right? And they were sort of a little bit outside the system. And so he tried to take all those people and say, well, they're just along for the ride. They're unnecessary. They're unimportant. It turns out that they're very important and very necessary, uh, which is how we get to where we are today. But one more step between there. He says the final thing we have to understand in all of this is money. Money, 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 money. He says the great thing about money is that, it, as they say, it answers all seasons. Right? If you want to travel, money can make you go. If you want a book, money can get it for you. If you want food, money can procure it for you. If you want rest, money can get that for you. If you want activity, money can get that. It converts into everything. And he says, and so we get confused. When we buy a car, he uses horse as an example, but car works for us. If we buy a car... We confuse the power, the, the, the perhaps beauty, the wonderness of the car with our own power. We think, ah, I have purchased it. Now the car is an extension of my power. Its speed is an extension of my speed. It's a demonstration of my capacity to make my force felt in the world. It realizes my ideas. And in part it does. That's the crazy thing. But in part it doesn't because it's always external to me. This is what money does. It does things out there. This is, so we have this strange relationship with money. We know we want it. It does for everything. It, 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 
Mark says it makes the ugly woman beautiful. It makes the valiant man whore himself. It makes the, the, the slow man fast. It makes the social pariah much loved. Right? I mean, he just goes through the whole thing. And it's, it's true. Right? Money, money answereth all, all seasons. And he said, so we become convinced that the getting of money is the getting of all good things. And so this is what we become focused on. Now, how do we get money, he says. Now, if we're not the proletariat, just slaving away in a factory, he says, the way we get money is we entice desire in other people. I need to create in you a desire for something that I have to sell for you. Then, if you buy what I have to sell, I get money, and you get the power that you think you derive from spending your money. And so he says, what money does is it does not solve needs or reduce problems, it amplifies them. It is a mechanism for increasing desires, needs, unhappiness, and unrest. This is money's function. So if you've ever seen, I, I, I love beer commercials for this reason, right? Semi-naked woman with beer. Right? Now you desire something. I can't sell you semi-naked women because that's marginally illegal. Uh, I can't do that on TV at least. But I can sell you a beer. And so I entice your desire and then offer you something that theoretically will fulfill it. Although we all know this is not going to work. <laughs> and yet somehow it works. People buy all this beer. Or whatever it is. Right? Why do we have all these variety of cars? Why don't we just have a couple of basic cars that get people around? A small car for small families, big cars for big families, trucks for people who need trucks, and then that's your done. Well, three cars, maybe four. Uh, choice, yes. We want choice. We can exercise our power in the world by being allowed to choose amongst all these things. Whether I need them or not has no bearing. Marx was also one of the first philosophers to point out quite categorically, he says, look, and this we also get very confused on this. He says, people always want to talk about needs and desires. You need these things, you desire these things. He's like, no, no difference. His phrase is, uh, needs, whether they come from the imagination or the stomach, are the same. A person needs a $400 pair of shoes the same way another person needs food. He says, to not recognize this is to make a moral judgment. He says, it is morally much better for someone to get food than for someone to get a totally worthless consumer item. But the need is the same. And he says, when you try to like separate out what, what means need and what means just a, a hopeless desire, he says, you just get lost. He says, you can't track that out. Particularly in a society, even at his time, in our society, of course, we're way past that, where any theoretical real need is so easily met that, you know, what do we need? We need some shelter, we need some food, maybe we need some people who like us. Okay, great, we've, we've, we've solved that problem. Right? If, if you're living on the street or going hungry in America, it's usually a social dislocation. There's not a lack of resources. Because our country is just super abundant with resources. And so he says, look, that's what we have to understand. <clears throat> that we generate these needs in other people. Our whole society, our whole consumer economy is based on this. And this is where Marx went wrong and this is how we got to today. But he said this can only last a little bit. I mean, how much of your economy can be made up of things that people don't really need and they buy discretionarily? <coughs> it turns out at least 70%. <laughs> Which is where we are today. Oh, perhaps, now, maybe not sustainable. But for a, a long time, you can at least have an economy that runs on 70% pure crap. And he says, he never predicted, this is where he went completely wrong. He's like, you know, you hit 2 or 3% and it's all going to blow up. But why were we able to get to this level? And here's where Marx really, I think, goes wrong. So far, everything seems good. What's been happening to the middle class over the last hundred years? It keeps growing. It keeps expanding. 
Marx thought that the proletariat would keep expanding. It didn't. It expanded for a long time until all the people from the agriculture had been sucked up. But you have to remember that in his age, um, in the 1840s, you're talking about economies that have 60-70% agriculture. England was very manufacturing dense, about 50%. Anybody know how many people work in agriculture today in the United States? It, it, it's, it's less than 2%. The Census Department can't track it anymore. It's sub-2. Because they can't track any industry that has less than 2%. So they always say it's less than 2 We don't know how much less. So even if we take 2%. So 98% is not in agriculture. And as we all know, manufacturing jobs have just been like this. <coughs> if you had a chart from 19, say, 50 to today, manufacturing jobs are just on a straight downhill. Marx thought that when this happened, you'd have unemployment, which would lead to civil unrest, which would lead to revolution. So either the people would get squeezed so hard to extract all their excess capital, and they would rebel, or there'd be some financial dislocation, they'd all get laid off, and they'd rebel. Both these things happened in small ways in Marx's lifetime. And he went, aha, see, look, the Paris Revolution. People are all laid off, the economy's up, you know, out of whack, people are rebelling, they overthrow their government. See? What he did not predict is the degree to which we love crap. Right? The degree to which we are, are more than happy to get money. And it turns out that if you promise people money or the opportunity to make some more money in the future, they love your economy. It doesn't matter what your economy is, by the way. You just tell people, look, yes, you're not rich now, but next year you can be a little richer, the year after that a little richer, your kids will be a little richer. Oh, everybody's happy. The day you tell them that, oh, your kids are probably going to be less rich than you are, everybody is unhappy. Um, and, and he did not, This again, he did not predict this. And so we're in this interesting situation where not worldwide, but particularly the United States, what they call developed economies, the proletariat that he talked about has not ceased to exist, but it's become a relatively small percentage of the economy. But the rules of capitalism keep functioning exactly the same way. So what he what, what's happened, and he predicted this a little bit, is he said, everybody who makes it a middle class wants to be a capitalist. Right? Why did people buy all these super expensive homes with mortgages with nothing down and really super rates at the end of it? Because they thought that in two years they'll be able to sell it for even more. Why? Because more money is good. If you watch news over the last couple of years, you've heard over and over again, oh, don't put your money in this because it's only returning 5%. If you put your money in real estate, you'll return 15% or 20%. Or if it's late at night and you shouldn't be watching these programs, 100% in five days, whatever it is. Right? Those bad things. See, this is the capitalist mindset, though. That's what you have to understand. This is what Marx was basically the first person to track out and understand. He says this is necessary. If you have a million dollars to invest, you don't want 100,000, you want 200,000. If you make 100 and somebody else makes 200, you think you're losing. If you make 200 and somebody makes 500, you think you're losing. And so people respond to this. We will all respond like capitalists. He never predicted this. He always thought capitalists would be a very small class. It never occurred to him that you could grow it and grow it and grow it and have a whole society of people who respond in this way, trying to maximize the return on their investment. By the way, if you've ever heard of the Chicago School of Economics, this is their argument. They say Marx was right about everything, except for this notion. He said, no, everybody's going to act like a capitalist. Marx said, oh, only a very few people would ever willingly do this. Because the flip side of it is, how do you make money? You make money by exploiting other people. You take their labor value, which is labor theory of value, and you take it from them. So if you sell me a house for $100,000 and I sell it for $200,000 a month later or a year later, 
it seems like I probably ripped you off. Right? We think of that as a good deal. Marx was not so clear on that. And he thought most people would be unwilling to do this. He thought it was only a particular class of people who would happily exploit or take advantage of these situations. Which is because he lived when he did and doesn't live today. Um, and, And so he was in this transitional period. Agricultural workers were going away, becoming the proletariat, proletariat's growing. Exploitation of the workers is becoming absolutely mind-boggling intense. Some of the things that he charts out in documents is that they made, um, for instance, they made a baby formula that was powdered milk and opium so that women could give it to their children in the morning. They would just, of course, go into a coma, more or less, and lay there unmoving for the rest of the day. They would go and work a 12-hour shift, come home at night, feed them another bottle because they've just worked a 12-hour shift, and then they pass out into a coma again. And so they had children that literally lived for years on these mixes of formula because the women have to work. He said this model is that everything becomes exploited from you, becomes alienated to you. Is your home your home? No. If you don't pay your rent, what happens? They kick you out. If you don't pay your mortgage, what happens? They kick you out. He said, even primitive man curled up in a cave had more ownership than modern working man. Notice that a feudal system of property ownership was inherited. People didn't really pay for property in feudal systems. In an aristocratic system, property was awarded. In an imperial system, which is to say with a king, the king has everything, you just get to use it. These are all different systems of property ownership. He said in modern property ownership, we're all alienated from our property because we can all lose it at any time. As soon as we stop paying for it, it's not ours. Our children, how do we look at our children? They're not to be loved and coddled and raised. They're now a burden. We have to, you know, immobilized them, as he said. And he was, by the way, he was famous for loving his children, and if you read the letters that his children wrote on his death, several, two of his daughters said he was the best possible father. Though we grew up in some poverty, you must remember that we were always happy because we always had marks. He was the best possible father any daughters could ever have. We had the best childhood, regardless of how much money we had or did not have. And I envy no person because of the joy we had in that family. So when he's writing about the kind of things that are being done to children, it's from somebody who loves children. He's like, look, they're just being crushed. They're being crushed in factories. They're being crushed at home. Why? Because they've been alienated from the family. They become resources or burdens. How else can you view them? They cost money to feed, or you could put them to work and make something from them. We're alienated from our homes because we have to pay for them. It's not mine. I haven't inherited it. I don't get to keep it as soon as I stop paying for it, I lose it. So we're alienated from our own time. What is your time worth? Remember, time is money. Time is money. right? We know that equation. They beat it into our head. You could be doing something productive to make money. And if you aren't, you're on the short end of the investment scale, let's face it. (laughs) You're wasting your time. Right? He says this whole psychology, this is one of the things that's great about Remarks is he was tracked out the psychology very clearly. He, he understood how this worked early. He's one of the first people. And he said, philosophically, he said, therefore, what this ends up being is an inhuman society. Therefore, it cannot last because we're human beings. Eventually, our human potential and our human desire to live not like that, to live unalienated, to be ourselves, to express ourselves, to be free of the bonds of labor that is alienated from us, not from work. He says people love to work. They just don't want their labor to be alienated from them. He says that means the revolution is coming. And like I said, he had no idea of the power of crap. He really didn't. I mean, he just didn't see this that, that we would be so easily seduced. He said religion was the opiate of the masses. Um, and that's that many people have commented that's only because he didn't have TV. <laughs> uh, but, but, 
Uh, it's, it's this, right? He, this, this notion of what keeps us sedentary, what keeps us from rising up. Um, which brings us sort of in a way to today. You may have noticed over the last few months, people are getting a little restless about the economy. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. One, of course, is blowing up. Um, two, because middle class people are losing their jobs. This is very, un- this is very rare. Middle class people aren't supposed to lose their jobs. And they aren't supposed to lose them for a long time. The societies never care when the poor lose their jobs. It's just historically, who cares about the poor? Screw them. So if the poor have an unemployment rate of 30%, we all shrug. Eh, who cares? It's not in the newspaper. This has happened repeatedly since the 1950s. It almost never makes the news. There's occasional riot. People get unrest. Maybe there's a strike. A little bit of news. Nobody cares. Ah, you start laying off middle class people and you are breaking the deal. The deal is, I get money, I buy crap, you leave me alone, I leave you alone, everything's good. If you take my money away, you take away my capacity to express myself, to make my power realized in the world. This means my abstract sense of value has left. What I'm left with it's a capacity to have a concrete sense of value. How do I make myself felt in the world really? If I don't have money, what am I left with? Oh, I have to act. I have to do something to make myself felt, to really be in the world. Now I'm not alienated from myself. I'm acting in the world as myself. I'm not doing it for money because I don't have money. I don't have a job. And so, if I go on strike, maybe I go on strike to get my job back, but notice this is different than working for a job. If I march in Washington, ah, see, that's different. And everybody, it makes everybody a little nervous. Right? How many people do you want in the streets? Is 1,000 people okay? How about 5,000? How about 10,000? How about 2 million people there for the inauguration? 2 million. Right? If two million people went to the inauguration, let me tell you, everybody noticed that. And what they realized is two million people could go on the streets if the economy keeps going downhill. This makes everybody nervous. This has happened once before in history, by the way, in our history, called the Great Depression, um, where we had an economic downturn serious enough to cause significant political change. We don't know if we're there yet. We might be, we might not, we'll see. But Roosevelt was very clear in this. He said, look, either we get the economy going or we're going communist. He says, everybody accuses Roosevelt of being left-wing. He kept saying, no, I'm a conservative. I'm the guy who doesn't want to become a communist. He says, if you have 30% unemployment, it's not going to be too long before people get pissed off and overthrow the government and something bad happens, as far as he was concerned. This is exactly what Marx said. But what Marx never foresaw was Roosevelt and those kinds of policies. That a government could step in and say, hey, this is so bad, we've got to basically give money to people. We've got to do stuff to make people's lives better or else they get up and overthrow us. So there's this new uh, complication of political economy that Marx really hadn't predicted. That governments would actually respond to this sort of thing. This was unheard of in Marx's time. What you did in Prussia was you got out the cavalry and they rode down on the people who were in the streets. And if the people in the streets had enough rocks and guns, well, then they killed all the people on the cavalry. Liberal government, conservative government. <laughs> Depends on who won the battle in the street. And so, and so the notion that you might be able to avoid those two extremes through some sort of strange policy change Really, this was Roosevelt's bet, and and he kind of won that. At least he's won it for a while. We'll see how long this bet keeps going. Um, And so we're in this very interesting time, many components of which Marx had predicted, some of which he hadn't. The capitalist desire for monopoly and maximization of profits. He had absolutely right. There's no question about this. People keep saying, why did our banks fail? Why did my bank or somebody else's bank or Citibank with all these smart people loan out on these horrible loans? Yeah, greed. Because let me tell you, if you're Citibank 
and you're making safe loans and getting 7% a year back, and some other bank is making crazy loans and getting 20% a year back, who's smart and who's dumb? The person making 7% is dumb. And those people would all be fired, and then these people over here would buy that bank, and they just make the bad loans anyway. So they, it's a system that requires, absolutely requires you to do crazy stuff like what's just happened. The only way to avoid it is what Adam Smith said. Adam Smith and, and Marx quotes him on this. He said, two businessmen only ever meet together to collude, to fix prices, cheat customers, or avoid government regulation. <laughs> that's, that's what he said. And Adam Smith should know. And he's, Adam Smith is often trumpeted as the great free market mind. No, no. Adam Smith was like, look, you can have a free market, but it's got to be so draconianly regulated by the government that we wouldn't even recognize it today as free market. But left to its own devices, the forces that Marx talked about kick in. And curiously, which we're experiencing now, at least a little bit, is if people feel their economic situation declining and their exploitation and fear increasing, they will rise up and overthrow whoever they perceive to be their masters. That was his model. That was his prediction. It didn't work out like he said at all in the sense of the proletariat didn't rise up, right? They just shrank away to nothing. And yet that force still seems to be there. It may be, although we don't know, we have no way of knowing this, but we're going to run this experiment, that it, it, if you piss the middle class off enough, they might do something. Historically, they, they, they've been active. That They really hate it when they lose stuff. The poor people, they never like Russia. It's so hard to get peasants to revolt. You can do anything to them. They never revolt. This is why Marx said the one country that will never go communist is Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Great prediction, huh? <laughs> uh, because he said, you know, they'll just, you can't, because they're, they're a bunch of peasants, and peasants never rise up. It turns out that you really, really have to abuse your peasants to get them to rise up. But the czars pulled it off. Uh, they, they abused them so much that they actually rose up. Middle class turns out to be much touchier. We, we don't take a lot of abuse. We, we take a little of abuse and then we get pissed off and we do stuff. Uh, or at least we'll see. Um, so finally, like I said, according to Marx, we're in this very interesting place um, because much of what he argued for is, is of course, clearly still operating. Um, but this middle class, is, is he wasn't predicted. And, and I, I really recommend, if you're interested in this kind of thing, of looking back at Roosevelt and his economic policies and what people were saying. Because what they were saying at the time was you have fascism and you have communism. Some people said we should go communist because communism is right, the Marxist line. Some people said, no, we should go fascism because that's the conservative response to this left-wing nonsense that is communism. Nobody was saying, oh, sort of liberal democracy, hedge your bets, sneak through the middle. People thought that was insane. They just thought Roosevelt was doomed. A few people did. Very, very limited number. They said, maybe you can salvage something between those two extremes. Um, it may be, turn out that you can, but not for very long. It may be that, really, at the end, maybe we do have to go to either really repressive societies or, 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 or of, of one flavor or another, depending on which direction you want the repression to come from. Um, but we don't know yet. Yeah. Uh, finally, I, I would suggest if you read the passages on alienation that are there, those are all from the economic and philosophic manuscripts, by the way. If you want to read one book by Marx, and you probably only want to read one, um, I, I, I strongly recommend that one because it's the notes and outlines that he took that were expanded dramatically in works like uh, Das Kapital, three volumes, um, and uh, Grundrisse, which was an even larger work that he had projected on this. Now, Das Kapital, particularly the early two volumes, are excellent, but they're filled with a huge amount of quantitative research. So he says, here's an argument, and here's 100 pages of examples, proofs, and, and logic to support that argument. So you go through that 100 pages, and you go, and it's cites, statistics, evidence, quotations, I mean, it's very dense scholarly work. So I don't want to criticize it in that sense. But you, get, you can get the outline of the ideas from a very short work called the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts. 
But where I think finally Marx really was right, and where he continues to be right, is on this question of alienation. On this question of what does it mean to be a human being in a world that's mediated primarily by money? How do you operate in this? And it's not clear that Marx had any idea how to get rid of it, but if, if you read through there, particularly if you read, read the whole sections in the manuscript, he says, look, no pimp was ever as creative or innovative as a marketplace is in trying to first arouse your desires and then meet them. Never in the history has this been the case. right? Think about, think about the myriad uh, commercials um, and enticements that we get repeatedly. Oh, you need this, you need that. If you don't have that, you're not a complete person. If you're not, oh, you should have this. You're too thin, you're too fat, you're too young, you're too old. Your hair is the wrong color. Your car is too small, your car is too big, your car uses too much gas, your car should be a Hummer. Right? It, it never ends. There is no finishing place. And so the psychology of how you escape from this world of alienation, his writing on that, I think, today is still quite vital, still, still resonates. Some of the teleological stuff is gone, the dialectical stuff sort of fell apart in the middle class, but his analysis of the problem and the way money works, particularly to exploit ourselves repeatedly, I think he, he, he was on to something there. But it's not at all clear, I would say, uh, what comes next. It wasn't clear to him, certainly, um, and, I, and I don't think we're, it's, it's clear to us. But, yeah. So I would say, yeah, Karl Marx, a hundred and some years later, Thank <laughs> you.